How do you change a generation? Was a question posed to Francis Schaeffer. How do you change a generation? Evolution or revolution? Slow change or, or hostile takeover? And he responded, neither. You tell a different story. Each of us tells a story with our sexuality. And it's either God's story or our own story. God's story is glorious and eternal and hope-filled. Our story is short-lived, centered on ourselves, small, broken, hopeless, and completely and utterly powerless to satisfy our deepest longings or change anyone else's lives around us. If we want to connect people to the hope-giving power of God's story, if we want to be a part of changing generation, we find ourselves living amongst Evolution won't work. Revolution won't work. Telling a new story, telling a different story, telling a better story will be what works. One of my hopes is that as a result of this eight weeks, your view and understanding of sexuality will shift from one that views sex as an individual, private act of raw appetite, accomplishing momentary pleasure, to viewing it as a means by which the greatest realities in the universe can be more fully grasped and understood and explained. Whether in your experience of sexual pleasure within the commitment and covenant of marriage or in your continence in singleness, both are means of telling the same story, the greatest story the world has ever known that we've completely disconnected ourselves from. I'm not sure if that makes any sense to any of you at all, but I hope it will by the time we're done. I have a few questions here that you asked me. So we took a survey a few weeks ago and we said, no questions off limits. What are questions you have about all things sex, singleness, and marriage? We got hundreds of responses in the cards. And here are a few of those questions I've taken out and selected to read to you here. These are your questions written by this church, people in this church, to me and the elders wanting answers for. How can I get past the former problem of lust that now displays itself by evil images of ungodly sex as depicted in porn that I can't get out of my head? Is self-gratification sexually wrong? Can you do it and still maintain sexual purity? What does a godly marriage look like when it comes to communication and sex? How do you open yourself up emotionally to someone who has wronged you emotionally and sexually so many times that you've shut yourself off from them? I feel like I need more sex in our relationship, but I can't communicate this to my wife. She doesn't understand the need. What do I do? How do I talk to my spouse about unhappiness in our sexual relationship? What do you do when your husband abandons your family emotionally but still wants sex from you? I want to serve him, but I'm afraid I don't love him. I trust Jesus. I love Jesus. But this is so far from what I pictured a marriage being like. I've made a conscious choice to pursue a heterosexual relationship with, while all the while feeling I was a homosexual. My spouse is aware of all circumstances. How do we actively build intimacy despite fears and doubts we both have? My husband has struggled with porn throughout our marriage. While it is better for him now, it still affects our sex life. How do I truly forgive him as his wife? How do you suggest I love him when he is so broken and full of shame? Husband has had past porn issues. How do I know if he's really done? Am I enough for him now? I'm so full of doubt. How should Christians view masturbation? And what should they teach their kids about it? Right? Wrong? Indifferent? Why do Christian women wear sexually provocative clothing? Tight and revealing clothing is killing me. (laughs) I love that one. Amen. How do you address sexual sin while overcoming the fear of judgment by the church? While single, are all expressions of sexuality sinful? If so, why? How far is too far? Is masturbation in marriage okay? Is everything in the marriage bed permissible? Why is it so hard to resist sex? Is it wrong? I want to share it with my girlfriend. What if one person wants to have sex more often than the other person? If I don't like the way I look, is it okay for me not to let my spouse see me naked? How can I break free from viewing porn? 
I feel like I've tried everything. And I feel worse because it feels like this should only be a guy problem. And I should not be struggling with this since I'm a woman. I've only told one person who is helping me, but I am still failing regularly. We've been married many, many years and have not been physically intimate for a large portion of that time. How do I handle my desires when there is not willingness from my spouse to share intimacy? What does the Bible say about birth control and oral sex? Are they wrong? How do you be a submissive, encouraging wife when your husband isn't a leader and church is just something to do when it's convenient for him? How do you make sex something that glorifies and pleases God and blesses your spouse? For those who struggle with sexual impurity, how do we escape? What truths can we remember when we are tempted by sexual impurity? Can someone be a Christian and a homosexual at the same time? How do you tell a Christian friend who's having sex outside of marriage that it's wrong? What should I say when their excuse to me is, we're married in our heart? That's my favorite one. I got a big paddle for that. It's coming next week. So, That's a sampling, a sampling, a small sampling of the questions that has come just from this church body. Not broken homeless people down on the street. Put together people who make lots of money, have jobs, contribute to society, have families, struggling under the weight of and brokenness of sexual sin. I read that list to you that's a small sampling of questions we receive from you for two reasons. First reason, to let you know that you are not alone. The lie of the enemy is to get you separated from community, bury you in sin, and then make you think you're the only one that struggles with that. And if you let it out of the closet, into the light, everyone will think lesser of you because you're the one person failing in that area. That is a lie, as the wave of questions reveal that we got from you. Good questions, honest questions, hurting questions, questions full of pain and longing for answers. It's not wrong to have the problem. It's wrong to let the problem dominate and control and enslave you, thinking Jesus isn't big enough to free you from it. Second reason I read that list for you, First reason, let you know you're not alone. Second reason is to give you a window into reality. So many Christians are so naively optimistic about humanity. And I just chuckle. I just chuckle. There is no reason to be optimistic about humanity outside of being redeemed by Jesus. Everyone is fallen. Everyone is broken. Everyone is abused. Everyone is an abuser. Everyone is looking for love in all of the wrong places. Everyone is worshiping false idols, and everyone is being kicked in the slats by the idols that never satisfy. So you're not alone, and we in the church are massively confused about this issue of sexuality. And yet sex is everywhere. TV, music, magazines, school, culture. We're inundated with sexual images. You can't go anywhere in our society without being pummeled with sexual images. It's absolutely everywhere. And we're getting all of our information about sex from all the wrong sources, from media outlets to the locker room. I'm here to tell you, they're all wrong. Every source you look to for instruction and teaching on sex outside of God's revelation is wrong and from the pit of hell aimed to get you sucked into a lie, believing it to be true. I, uh, I'm always annoyed at the grocery store because I try to go to the grocery store and buy something like a gallon of milk. Fairly innocent and get assaulted with sexual images. And so I thought, I'm going to go, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to, as a sample, I'm going to pick up magazines at the store that, that are within arm's reach of bubble gum and Snickers bars and see what I find. And so I drove to Safeway and I'm texting, you know, and I'm, I'm in the middle of my day and I, oh, yes, and I walk into Safeway and I stood there in the magazine aisle and I stood there at the checkout stand and I couldn't do it. <laughs> I could not do it. I'm like, I'm not going to buy 15 of these magazines. I'm going to look like a pervert. 
Just my luck, my mom will show up right about then, <laughs> buying salary or something, and be like, Josh, what are you doing? So I texted Eva and sent her down there, and she bought all these for me. <laughs> Better make someone else feel like a pervert than me, right? <laughs> and I, I took them home last night, and they were, I, I said, hey, babe, see if you can find anything good in here for me to yell at, yell about. And uh, I had set them in my office, and they sat like this on a pile right next to my desk. So I could occasionally look over at them while I was studying for this sermon and get righteously pissed at the amount of garbage being shoved down our culture's throats in the name of pleasure. And so I gave it to my wife. I said, hey, see if you can find anything good. And, and she was quiet over there, and I'm studying. Wait, you find anything? I look over, and my wife is weeping. She said, I had no idea this level of brokenness is being portrayed as normal. And she read story after story after picture after article, and well, which I'm not going to read because they're basically pornographic. Teen Vogue. I'm going to show you the pictures of these, and I want to see if you can see a common denominator. Now, there's an article in, in Teen Vogue on virginity, the new Vogue. I thought that would be encouraging. It wasn't. I might read some excerpts of it next week. Teen Vogue, the average reader of 17 in Teen Vogue. Do you know how old the average reader of, of, of 17 in Teen Vogue is? 27. The average age of the reader of these magazines, 27 millions of teenage readers, too, the predominant median being that age. That's where it goes. That's where it belongs. That's where it came from. That's where it should go back to. 17. Oxygen. Hairstyles to make you look sexy and skinny. Vanity Fair, the love life of Taylor Swift. Shape. Health, abs, more shape, (laughs) muscle and fitness, allure, how to allure men like Katie Holmes. That's what you need to know, right? Lucky, bizarre, totally bizarre, glamour. The secret sex lies of 1,000 women, what everyone you know did last night. El, Ellie, L, L something, L, other, other, O, El Trasho. (laughs) Sports Illustrated, swimsuit issue. Cosmo, this is fascinating, Cosmopolitan. Rachel Bilson, try her style and sexy secrets. Sweet and sexy moves, orgasms guaranteed. Stuff you think he wants in bed, but really doesn't. The crazy lie I told to get my boyfriend in bed. Fresh, flirty, fun. And looks under 50. Now, let's just find a random ad. Okay, the unpeel. Well, let's just find a better one. We can't show that one. Okay, no. Okay, ole! Here's an, an ad in the Cosmopolitan. About four million of these sold a month. Ole. You know how much it costs, ole, to run this one-page color ad in one magazine? $320,000 to run this ad. You know what that means? Cosmo is making a killing off of selling trash about sexuality. Here's the irony of those magazines. They sell more and more and more magazines every month. Their business growth curve looks like this. The irony of that is it reveals that what they're selling doesn't work. Tips, techniques, strategies, and positions for how to have more, better, hotter sex. And if it worked, you wouldn't need to buy any more magazines. Right? But it doesn't work. And you're left unsatisfied and less fulfilled. So you come back and you buy it again the next month, hoping that this month's edition will have the silver bullet. So we want to confront the lies of our culture with the truth of God's word, the only way you can know you're buying into and believing a lie is to compare it to what is true. So the goal of this series is as follows. I wrote this out, and it's on my notebook as I study. 
to lift sexuality out of the sordid sitcom cesspool of Satan's lies and restore it to a place of glorious beauty, reverence, holy honor, and pleasure in the church. Restoring the abused and broken, freeing the slave and addicted, rescuing the false worshiper from his or her destructive idolatry, and returning all of us again to worshiping Jesus as better than his gifts, so that we can once again enjoy his gifts as he intended. Now, none of you will remember that. It's a really good sentence, but you'll never remember it. But it's there to give me a governing and guiding North Star for why we're going through this series. And I'm praying every one of those prayers come true for you. Because I have a conviction. And that conviction is we are all accountable to each other for glorifying God in our sexuality. The lie is that sexuality is private. The lie is that you're, you're your own body, you can do whatever you want, and as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, who cares? The Hebrew author in Hebrews 12 wrote this, see to it that no one is sexually immoral. The bottom line is we're in this together. The battle against sexual sin and lust is a battle charge given to the entire church. It's a corporate exercise. We have responsibility to each other to keep each other physically, emotionally, spiritually strong, and sexually pure. And I'm praying that as a result of this sermon and this series, that these issues get brought out into the light to be discussed in light of God's truth and God's word that we might grow in holiness together. And what we need then is a renewing of our minds. When it comes to sexuality, as we've seen lots of confusion, lots of devastation, a lot of past abuse and past hurt, present abuse and present hurt in the church today. And if anyone on the planet, we should be the ones clear on this issue. Our God made it. Our God designed it. Our God created it. It's ours. And yet the church is strangely silent on this issue when everyone else is talking about it and it's killing our culture. They're talking about it. We should be talking about it too. Rightly telling a different story so that not only the truth of God's word but the beauty of God's design is seen and preached and experienced by a people group on the planet. Romans 12, 2 says this, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you may be able to test and discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do you want good and acceptable and perfect experiences in your sexuality? Then don't look here. Don't drink here. Don't feast here. Don't learn and listen here. Feast, drink, listen, learn here. God's truth, God's word. That won't make any sense to people listening on the the tape, I just realized. (laughs) Oh, well. Good thing you're here live, huh? Most Christians are having their minds shaped more by the world than the word. And that's a problem. Here's how we're going to talk about the topic. I'm going to set this up. For us as we move into this eight weeks, I'm sorry if it's a bit of a slow start. I need to kind of set the pieces in place for our conversation for the next eight weeks. I not only want to teach the truth of God's word about sexuality, I want to model for us in doing so how to talk about sexuality. And so three words are guiding my thinking as we come to this topic. The first word is the word weightiness. I could not possibly quantify for us, the level of seriousness and weight that marks the topic we're taking up over these next few weeks. And I want to address it as such. There should be a weight and gravitas to the messages because what we're talking about is weighty and glorious and beyond our ability to even begin comprehending it is goodness. So there should be a connected to how we talk about it and that it's holy and righteous and honorable and glorious and therefore it should not be handled flippantly like a sitcom TV show. 
Not only is it connected to the greatest realities in the universe, it is also simultaneously under attack by the enemy with everything he can throw at us. So this is not fun and games when we come to this topic. This is war. I get that. Second word, gladness. So while sexuality is one of the the weightiest things we could talk about, it's also one of the most glorious and wonderfully happy things we could talk about talk about. One of the greatest pleasures God created for men or women to experience. So wonderful, so good that it should be talked about with great joy and great gladness. So yes, weighty gravitas there should be, but there should also be lighthearted gladness because it's a part of God's good creation. The third word, weightiness, gladness, and frankness. We speak reverently, we speak gladly, but we also speak, speak frankly because sexuality is a part of God's creation and it is good. Too many Christians think that to be Christian means to avoid sex or avoid talking about sex. Too many Christ, non-Christians think the church thinks sex is taboo and that Christians are prudes. This is unfortunate because the Bible is anything but a prudish book. It offends the prude. It offends those who want to cloak sexuality unnaturally and keep it in the dark. And we'll see some of that today. And I'm here to tell you, your pastor and his wife are the furthest thing from prudes on this planet. And it's a good thing. So weightiness, yes. Gladness, yes. Frankness, yes. Listen to Al Mohler. Christians have no right to be embarrassed when it comes to talking about sex and sexuality. An unhealthy reticence or embarrassment in dealing with these issues is a form of disrespect to God's creation. Whatever God made is good, and every good thing God made has an intended purpose that ultimately reveals his glory. When conservative Christians respond to sex with ambivalence or embarrassment, We slander the goodness of God and hide God's glory, which is intended to be revealed in the right use of creation gifts. Isn't that good? So we got to get over our embarrassment of this topic as if we're old maids. It's killing the culture that we're not talking about it because everybody else is and they're all wrong. So we want to speak as the church prophetically full of truth, yet pastorally full of compassion. We want to speak frankly, but also with discretion. We want to speak boldly, and yet with broken-hearted spirits, knowing the amount of destruction surrounding this topic. We want to be clear and objective, yet layered in nuance. That's the tension God's calling us to walk in as believers. And the Bible has a lot to say about sexuality. You think, well, I did a word study once on sex, and all I found was that Paul says you shouldn't be sexually immoral, and don't do this, and don't do that. And the Bible is just a, a book of a list of, oh, you can't do this, and you can do that. And my takeaway is that the Bible is completely negative against sexuality, which could not be further from the truth. A better way to go about studying what God thinks about sexuality would be to do a word study on the phrase, all things. Or everything, right? All things and everything are natural, smaller subsets of which sexuality is is a subset of everything, right? So doing that, what would the Bible have to say about sexuality? Here's a few samples. There's dozens of these. Here's a few. Colossians 1. By him, all things, including the subset of sex and sexuality, were created. Sex was created by God. 1 Timothy 4, everything created by God is good. Subset, sex and sexuality is a subset of everything which God created and it's good. Ephesians 1, God put all things, including sex and sexuality, under the authority of Christ. So sex is subject to Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10, whatever you do, whatever you do, do all things to the glory of God. Therefore, it's the Christian's duty to win having sex to be doing it for the glory of God. Philippians 2, do all things without grumbling. Do all things without grumbling. So when we have sex, we're to do it without grumbling. Amen? Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. 
in all things always, which means we are to rejoice in the Lord during sex. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, I will not be enslaved by anything, therefore be warned. We must be on our guard to be enslaved by sexuality. And so I want to endeavor to put God's truth about sexuality on the table that our minds might be renewed by it, that we might see afresh and anew the lies we're believing right now to be true and slay those lies once and for all with the truth of God's word. So here's the one big idea we'll look at this morning. God creates sexuality as a gift given to humanity, created in his image, that they might know him more fully, God in Christ. Or that they might know God in Christ more fully. I'll say that again. God created sex as a good gift given to humanity, Created in his image that they might more fully know God in Christ. We're going to take that and break it down three ways for our study and be done. First piece of the big idea is that God created sexuality. When I began this sermon, I said that we tell stories to the world with our sexuality. But if we're to understand our small story, why it's broken... And how it can be fixed, we need to go back to the beginning of another story, namely the story, to understand sexuality, where it came from, what it was designed for, and how we've gotten to a place now where sex is nothing more than raunchy perversion and the raw satisfying of animalistic appetites in humans that are expected to act no different than dogs in heat. If we're to understand the difference of God's intentions for humanity, we've got to go back to the better story, the bigger story, our broken story is inside of. And so we're going to go back to Genesis chapter 2. So if you're there, Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 18. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. Can I get an amen from anybody in the room? Amen. I got a hand raised in the back. Yes. It is not good for man to be alone, as I have proven. I will make for him a helper fit for him. Can I get our hand raised in the background? Amen. Woo! That is a good news for modern man. I'm loving this story. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to all the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. I love the description of that. It's kind of a little humor, right, in the story. Adam's like, hey, I'm here on earth. Wow, cool, garden, crazy, food to eat. Boy, this is awesome. Thanks, God. Animals, okay, I'll name them. <gasps> Lion. Ooh, it looks kind of big and ferocious. Okay, maybe the next one here. Huh, tiger. Man, pass on that one, tiger. Armadillo. Mm, that one, man, I don't think that's going to work. You know, all these animals walking by and going, they're great, but no one's them going to work for me. I don't want to snuggle with an armadillo. You got anything better? No helper found fit for him. So he had beings above him in the Godhead, Father, Son, Spirit. He had creation below him in animals he was ruling over. He had no one in community to live in on par with him as human created in the image of God. So God solves that problem, verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a whoa man and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. Six brief observations about that text we can walk away with. Observation number one, Adam was alone and it was no bueno. No good. Everything else in creation God had made and he was like, boom, good, boom, good, boom, good. Adam alone, pathetic. 
The only thing in all of creation was at, that was not good was Adam being alone. Observation number two, God created male and female in his image and likeness with dignity, value, and worth. Look at chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created man, kind. Now that's the account in chapter 1. Chapter 2 zeroes in then on that account in more detail and fleshes it out in the verses we read. So God sees that Adam's alone, declares it not to be good, and creates a second human in the form of a female equal to male in value, dignity, and worth. Both men, both women created in the image of God. Not one created to fulfill the animalistic appetites of the other. No, no. Both equal in worth and value in God's eyes. Observation number three. Love is more like a song than a math equation. Okay? I love this part. Adam's like, you know, that armadillo kind of was, a, was brutal. And all of a sudden, boom, there's Eve. And he's like, oh, I'll call you woman. I mean, he sings a song and he names her. This is a Hebrew song, the rhythm. It's a poem. He writes poetry. I always tell Chris, hey, man, when Adam saw Eve, he didn't pull out a spreadsheet. He wrote a song. He wrote a poem. He was moved. There is an art to love that is not mathematical. Fourth observation, marriage is for one man and one woman by God's design. We see God here creating the first bride, walking her down the aisle, the first dad to give a daughter away to a son. We see God performing the first marriage as the first pastor, blessing this new union. One man, one woman for a lifetime is God's design for marriage, period, of which we'll get into later. Observation number five, God created sex. He made male bodies and female bodies so that sex works. And not only does it work, it's fun and enjoyable and wonderful. How beautiful in God's creation that at the apex of humanity being like God the most in creating something from nothing, he would, he would cause that to happen in the act of sexual relationships where we're experiencing more joy, more pleasure than any other experience available in humanity. That's a sign of God's goodness that he loves us. He's given us this gift to enjoy and to steward that's our God. And last observation, sex is not shameful. They were naked and unashamed. And this is party time. They are running around the garden, woo, you know, chasing it, slapping and playing on, dodging, woo. And it's, it's all good. No shame. All good. Naked. Woo. <laughs> That does raise a question about the new heavens and new earth, but we'll talk about that later. (laughs) It was nirvana, it was perfection, it was heaven on earth, and they were naked. No shame. I should tell us something about the nature of sexuality in that if we are experiencing it and it results in shame, something's broken. Here's a big idea I want us to walk away from under this phrase, God creates sexuality as a gift given to humanity, created in his image as a means by which we more fully know him or know Christ in God, God in Christ. God creates sexuality. Here's the big idea I want you to walk away. Maybe some of you here aren't believers and you're checking church out or you showed up for Easter and came back. I'll give one more run. Give Josh one more shot and see if I like it or not. Or you're here and you're confused. I want you to walk away with this point drilled into your skull. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Sexual pleasure is one of the most glorious experiences of human experience, and it was God's design. There's this misunderstanding in the world that says Christians don't have any fun, and non-Christians have all the fun. To which I respond, no, 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 no. A thousand no's. The children of God experience all of the fun. The, those who have not been adopted and have run away from God are the ones who experience all of the brokenness. You see the picture? God's people in God's place under God's rule in the garden brought great blessing. What brings great destruction? God's people running away from God's place, resisting God's rule and experiencing destruction in the consequences of their choices. So the thought or the idea That to live a Christian life and to follow God's ways is prudish and slow and boring and you miss out 
And if you really want to experience life, reject all of that and run to fulfilling all of your sexual appetites is a lie from the pit of hell. So I want you to hear this very clearly. If you're here and new, or you're not a believer, I want you to hear this from a Christian pastor. That I, as a man who loves Jesus, that I, as a man who believes the Bible to be true, and who by God's grace is endeavoring to live and walk within the very narrow confines and restrictions of God's word in relationship to sexuality, in regularly experiencing incredible and blessing and reward. Let me get more specific. Free, frequent, fun, raucous, joy-filled, shout to the heavens intimacy is what your pastor regularly experiences with his wife. Can I get an amen? Woo! Sharon's home with sick kids, so I, I, I could say that. <laughs> because God's plan works. I'll stack my sex life up to any stud running around the city trying on different women like their tires to be ridden and worn out and discarded like trash. That man does not have the capacity to experience the kind of joy and pleasure and fulfillment and satisfaction of the man who's walking according to God's word in his sexuality. No comparison, no contest, period. Now, I'm not saying that out of some stupid machismo pride. I'm saying that because I am jealous, so jealous for us to believe in the truth of God's word and to discard the lies of the enemy that says, eh, God's kind of stodgy. He's kind of old fashioned. If you really want to live it up, screw that and go do this. I want that to be stamped on our hearts. God is not against your joy. He's for it. Therefore, he places needed restrictions on your sexuality for your good. For your good. As long as you're worshiping sex as a God, you will never experience its full power and potential. You can't. You'll only be free to be a slave to it. You become addicted to it. You'll misuse it and use it in a way it was not designed to be used. It won't satisfy, so you have to pervert it. And then in the perverting of it and the experiencing of the perversion of it, you'll reap destruction in your own life and the lives of those around you. Absolutely guaranteed. Recipe never fails. Romans 1. Point number two I want you to get under God creates sexuality. Sex and pleasure are God's ideas. Second piece, Satan cannot create, he can only pervert. You need to get that. It wasn't as if God created the universe and then Satan came along and said, I want to ensnare people, so I'll create something better like sex and sexual pleasure that will draw people away. No, 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 no. God created sex. God created sexual pleasure. Satan cannot create, he can only pervert what God has already created. He has no game. He's simply a pretender. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. All he has to work with is what God has already made. Now, I've always said that, but I found a passage in C.S. Lewis's book, Screwtape Letters, that says it much better than that. So I'm going to read it for you now. C.S. Lewis's book, Screwtape Letters. How many have read the Screwtape Letters, by the way? Okay, a few of you. Good. It's a book C.S. Lewis wrote where the main character is screw tape. He's a devil. He's got a nephew, Wormwood, that he's mentoring and discipling in how to, how to distract and destroy Christians. So you kind of got to reverse your thinking because the enemy is God. And so when he talks about the enemy, he's actually talking about God. And when he talks about good things and winning things and good strategies, he's actually talking about demonic strategies. And so you kind of got to flip your mind around. It's very, it's a very well-written piece. Duh, obviously, understatement of the universe. (laughs) Me telling C.S. Lewis, oh, pretty, pretty good piece. Yeah, well done. I recognize that sounded stupid, so I had to, I had to say that. He's, he's an amazing author. I mean, world-renowned author. In the book Screwtape Letters, Screwtape is frustrated and appalled about the enemy, who is, of course, God, and that he is actually out to make people happy. 
And that frustrates him that he's out to actually make people happy. And that all the parts of his plan that don't seem like as fun, the disciplines and, and the restrictions, are actually clever ruses and deceptions of the enemy to increase his people's happiness. He says as follows, and I quote, Our enemy is actually a hedonist at heart, sniffs screw tape. All of those fasts and vigils and stakes and crosses, those are only a facade. Or only like foam on the seashore. Out at sea, out on his sea, there is pleasure and more pleasure. He makes no secret of it. At his right hand are pleasures evermore, as he writes in that blasted book of his. He's vulgar, Wormwood. He has a burgoyous mind. He has filled the world full of pleasures. He goes on. Never forget then that when we are dealing with any pleasure, Wormwood, in its healthy and normal and satisfying form, we are, in a sense, on the enemy's ground. Or on God's ground, right? You tracking? I know we have won many a soul through pleasure. All the same, Wormwood, it is his invention, not ours. He made the pleasures. All our research so far has not enabled us to produce a one. All we can do is to encourage the humans to take the pleasures which our enemy has produced at times or in ways or in degrees which he has then forbidden. Hence, we always try to work away from the natural condition of any pleasure to that in which it is least natural, least redolent of its maker, and least pleasurable. Here it is. An ever-increasing craving... For an ever diminishing pleasure. Now that is the formula for success. Are you hearing the enemy's strategy? An ever increasing craving for an ever diminishing pleasure is the formula. And that's exactly what's going on in our culture today. The law of diminishing returns, a natural and good and God-created appetite being lusted after to be fulfilled in all of the wrong places, in all of the wrong ways, and it only seeks to create in us a deeper hunger because it's not satisfied, so we buy the stupid magazine the next month and the next month and the next month. An ever-increasing hunger for an ever-decreasing pleasure. The result is that our world is full of anxiety, anger, fear, confusion, condemnation, despair, panic attacks, addictions, denial, sleep disturbances, insecurities, and embarrassments largely connected to buying the lie that Satan has sold us in which we have swallowed hook, line, sinker in relationship to this area of sexuality. So point number one, God created sex And it's good. Satan cannot create. He can only pervert. God's intentions is for your happiness. And he's jealous for it in this area. Point number two. God gave sexuality to humanity as a gift. God created male. He created them female. He created sexuality. He created to work between the two of them. And he gave it to them as a gift to enjoy and to steward. That's all I'll say about that because that's next week's entire sermon. It's going to be a ton of fun. You won't want to miss it. Point number three. God gave us sexuality in order to more fully know him. And this might be the most confusing. God created sex as a gift, gave it to humanity, who's created in his image, that they might more fully come to know God in Christ. Where do I get that? Walk carefully with me. Bruce Marshall in his novel, The World, The Flesh, and and Father Smith, wrote a very provocative sentence, and it is follows. The young man who knocks on the door of the brothel is unconsciously looking for God. Isn't that good? The young man who knocks at the door of the brothel is unconsciously looking for God. See, Marshall's connecting with the church does not see, and that is that there is a connection between sexuality and worship. There's a connection between sexuality 
and the God or gods we worship. Peter Kreeft, after arguing that sex is the biggest religion in our culture today, says this. Sex is like religion, not only because it is objectively holy in itself, but also because it gives us subjectively a foretaste of heaven, of the self-forgetting, self-transcending, self-giving that is what our deepest hearts are designed for, long for, and will not be satisfied until they have. Because we are made in God's own image, and this self-giving constitutes the inner life of the Trinity. He's connecting sexual oneness experienced in humanity to giving us a picture or an idea of what the unity in the Trinity is like. It's a metaphor to understand more wholly and more fully the unity and the pleasure and the joy and the satisfaction of intimate community within the Godhead. That's pretty radical. So sex is designed as a pointer to, but never a substitute for God. Another way to think about it is like this. Sex and sexuality exist by God as creation category for us to more fully understand who God is, what he is like, and what relationship with him will be like ultimately and fully in eternity. In other words, sexuality exists to build the framework, not that we worship, but from which we stand upon to see and understand and comprehend bigger, more glorious, more grandeur, more holy, more satisfying, more joy-filled realities in who God is. Sex and sexuality create categories in which God can reveal to us more fully who he is in Christ. The brilliant philosopher and mathematician Blaise Pascal put it this way There was once in man a true happiness, of which now remain to him only the mark of an empty trace, which he in vain tries to fill from all his surroundings, seeking from things absent the help he does not obtain in these things. But these are all inadequate because the infinite abyss can only be filled by an infinite and immutable object, that is to say, only by God himself. What I want to do to end our time is to give you and trace for you a brief biblical theology that will help you hopefully see this truth to be true. The Bible is a book about marriage. We saw in the very beginning, right? It starts with a marriage. It, 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 it begins with a marriage. The first marriage. God creates man, creates woman, oversees and, and pastors him through the first marriage. And it is good. And that marriage gets broken by sin. The fall ensues. And everything else then is infused with brokenness and sin. Of which we'll get to later in the series. Then through the rest of the story, there is infused in the story central themes of marriage as the most dominant metaphor God gives for how he relates to us as a covenant-keeping God. Listen how John Piper puts it. God created human beings in his image. Male and female, he created them with capacities for intense sexual pleasure and with a calling to commitment in marriage and continence and singleness. And his goal in creating human beings with personhood and passion was to make sure that there would be sexual language and sexual images that would point to the promise and the pleasures of God's relationship with his people and our relationship to him. In other words, the ultimate reason, not the only reason, but the ultimate reason why we are sexual is to make God more deeply known. The language and the imagery of sexuality is the most graphic and the most powerful that the Bible uses to describe the relationship between God and his people, both positively when they are faithful and negatively when we are not. Now, this does not mean that we, our relationship with God is sexual in nature. That's perversion. That's paganism. That's why they have prostitutes at pagan temples. That's stupidity. That's not what this is saying. What the Bible is saying is that marriage and sexuality exist to give us a foretaste, an example, some reference point to grab onto, to think about when we look to God and understand our relationship with him and his faithfulness to us and our unfaithfulness to him. Are you seeing the weight that the Bible puts into this matter? It's weighty and it's holy because it represents God's love for us in Christ. 
Listen to how Ezekiel puts it. If, if you can listen without embarrassment, then, then this is a very, very, very explicit text. Do you think though the Bible is, is, you know, tame and... No, no, no. The Bible makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Because Ezekiel chapter 16, he's, he's speaking on behalf of God. And keep in mind, God has chosen Israel of all the people on the earth, to experience his special covenant love, his unique and personal covenant love, until the day when the Jewish Messiah, which we know as Christ, would come and live and die and take their sinner's place. And that gospel would then overtake the banks of Israel. And so the relationship God has with Israel in the Old Testament is a shadow of the relationship Jesus will have with his church when he comes. And here's how Isaiah or Ezekiel describes it. God speaking here, verse 4. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No, I pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you. But you were cast out on the open field, for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. What's God saying? You were the runt of the litter. You were cast out. There was nothing beautiful about you that anyone wanted to be a part of. And when I passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood, I said to you in your blood, live. I said to you in your blood, live. I made you flourish like a plant in the field. And you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown. Yet you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age of love. And I spread the corner of my garment over you. And covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. That's the picture of God's utterly free and undeserved and ill deserved grace and mercy and love towards us, who were the runt of the litter, no beauty by which anyone should want to have us. That's a radical graphic picture that God is using the metaphor of marriage for to explain his kind of faithful, covenant-keeping love for Israel. That's how the Christian life begins if you're in Christ. He found you lowly and broken and undeserving and said to you in your death, live! And you lived. He goes on. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil. You grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty, and your renown went forth from the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord. So you see, God, give an example. I found this ugly thing, and my love has been what's made it now beautiful. But you trusted in your beauty. And you played the whore because of your renown and lavished your whoring son on any passerbyer. Your beauty became his. You took some of your garments and made for yourself colorful shrines. And on them you played the whore. The like has never been nor ever shall be adulterous wife who receives strangers instead of her husband. Men give gifts to all prostitutes, but you gave your gifts to all of your lovers, bribing them to come to you from every side with your whorings. That's a picture of Israel's unfaithfulness. When God's trying to describe the depth of abhorrence and evil that they're idolatry is causing, he uses the metaphor and analogy of adultery so they can understand, oh, that level of pain, that level of destruction, that level of betrayal, that level of hurt. Wow. Israel, in pursuing other gods other than the one true God, is acting like a whore. Then comes his judgment. Therefore, O prostitute, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because your lust was poured out and your nakedness uncovered in your whorings with all of your lovers and with all of your abominable idols and because of the blood of your children that you gave to them. Therefore, behold, I will gather all of your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all those you loved and all those you hated. 
I will gather them against you from every side and will uncover your nakedness to them that they may see all of your nakedness or literally all of your vulnerability. God says, okay, my judgment to you will be, I'll give you what you want. And I'll abandon you and leave you to all those people that you thought would really satisfy. We'll see what you think when they're done with you, when they're done using you, when they're done abusing you, when they toss you aside after their appetites are fulfilled. See the connection there? How many in this room have chased and pursued love and satisfaction and pleasure and fulfillment from all sorts of other lovers and everyone left you feeling used or cheap. God says, that's what you do when you walk away from me and worship other gods. Except it's about a billion times worse, but it gives you a little flavor of what it's like. But it doesn't stop there. He continues, for thus says the Lord God, Ezekiel 16, 59. I will deal with you as you have done. You have, who have re- despised the oath in breaking the covenant. Yet I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. Watch this. I will establish for you an everlasting covenant. I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall know that I am the Lord. That you may remember and be confounded. And never open your mouth again because of your shame. When I atone for you for all that you have done declares the Lord. You see what he's saying? The book of Hosea takes a prophet of God who's married to an adulterous woman and he uses that prophet's marriage to the adulterous woman as an analogy for Israel. See how this prophet's woman makes a fool of him in the city by running around with every other man except him? That's what you're doing with me. And yet, I will pursue you, rescue you, save you, love you, take you back, forgive you, redeem you, cleanse you, and make you mine own again because I will stay faithful even in the face of your abhorrent and evil and destructive unfaithfulness. How much greater we can existentially understand that when we see the destruction of adultery all around us. And so in the New Testament, Jesus Christ shows up. He dies. He rises again. And he gathers his people to himself. And then Paul says this in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. And that is a fulfillment of of Ezekiel's prophecy when he said, I will remember my covenant with you and I will establish for you an an everlasting covenant. I will atone for your sins. And that promise comes fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And Paul even says, when a man loves a woman self-sacrificially and provides and protects and defends her at great cost to himself, that's a great mystery. And oh, I'm saying, I'm talking about Christ and the church. So the story begins with a wedding of a man and a woman who are unable to follow God and they break faithfulness from him. The story continues of the marriage metaphor being used for God to communicate to his people his love for them, even with their unfaithfulness towards him, his never-ending, never-stopping, all-powerful, steadfast, covenant-keeping, faith-filled love for unfaithful, adulterous people. And then the story ends with a wedding. Look at this. Revelation. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. Question, where did the bride get the bright and pure linen to wear for the wedding? 
from the groom. So from beginning to end, God uses the metaphor of marriage and sexuality as category creation for us to stand on the framework of and look to and understand and comprehend more fully his covenant-keeping love for us as adulterous people, as unfaithful people, driven by fleshly lusts and animalistic appetites that we fulfill in all of the wrong places. So Piper says, God has made us powerfully sexual so that he would be more deeply knowable. We are given the power to know each other sexually so that we might have some hint, some clue, some shadow of what it will be like to one day know Christ supremely. God created sex as a gift given to humanity, created in his image, that they might more fully know God in Christ. That's the big idea that everything else we're going to talk about will stand on. Here's the beauty of telling that story. In our sexual purity before marriage, in our willingness to wait, we're telling the story of a better groom who's been waiting 2,000 years to receive the prize of his bride and will one day receive her perfectly when he comes again. When we experience sexual purity within marriage, we're telling the story that there is a faithfulness to be known and a unity to be experienced and a oneness to be known and a self-giving away that results in greater pleasure for ourselves. that tells us something of who our God is and how he works and functions. We tell a different story to the world looking for love and satisfaction and pleasure and joy in all of the wrong places, and it's devastating them. There's a better story to be told, and the church should be telling it with how they live and how they handle their sex and their sexuality. Now, we're going to take communion this morning, and it's going to work as follows. Um, The men are going to come up, take it back, serve their families, we'll take together. If you're a believer here this morning, you come to the communion table celebrating the fact that there's a bridegroom who has pursued you in all of your whoring and of all of your adulterousness and has loved you anyways. And his love has made you who are unlovely, lovable. If you're here and not a believer, this is your opportunity to consider the fact that there is one who loves you more completely, more fully, more faithfully than you can even begin to comprehend. Even right now in your adulterous, whoring, and false worship of false idols. He loves you, is pursuing you, and is willing and ready to forgive you and atone for your sins. It's a staggering thought. We don't get it either, but we celebrate it every week. And we'll stand and we'll sing and we'll celebrate God's goodness together. When we partake of this communion this morning, let it remind us as a tangible reminder that God loves us in ways that even the greatest human experience can't even begin to foreshadow and point us to the God whose faith-filled love for us is unending and unwavering even in our unfaithfulness and our adultery. So God created sex as a gift, gave it to humanity, created in his image that we might more fully know God in Christ. That's the foundational brick we'll stand on then to look at and study everything else these eight weeks when we get to the practical nitty-gritty stuff. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that lifts our gaze out of the sordid sitcom cesspool that Satan has caused us to wallow in as a culture. Father, forgive us as a church for being silent on this issue of sex and sexuality in which you created to be good and glorious and wonderful. And Father, I pray for each and every person here who has experienced sexual brokenness, who's experienced sexual addiction, or is even now in the middle of a slavery that they cannot break free from. I ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, you would come into their life through the power of your Holy Spirit and fill their heart with a deeper affection that they would know maybe for the first time what it means to fight fire with fire 
that they would maybe understand for the first time God is not against their joy. God is not against them experiencing pleasure. God is for their joy. God is for their pleasure. And therefore, he gives clear instructions about how to live. And when we falter and when we fail and when we fall off the path, he is quick to come and love and forgive and atone and wash away the sin that we have pursued. Father, I pray that words like clean and washed and new would be words that we experience as a church throughout the course of this series, that we would experience your Holy Spirit bringing restoration and redemption where there once was only brokenness, only confusion, only guilt, only shame, only condemnation, only anger. And Lord, as you begin restoring us and making us new, the stories we tell with our sexuality, what we do and what we do not do would tell a greater story to the world that there are greater pleasures to be had greater joys to be experienced at the right hand of God. There are pleasures evermore. Satan only distorts. God creates for our good and our joy. And there is great joy to be had in the shade underneath his design. We pray that our lives would demonstrate to the watching world not only the truth of God in relating to this issue, but also the beauty and the wonder and the joy of living out God's design as you have instructed us. So as we come, we come to worship you, Father. We come remembering the broken body of Christ, the shed blood of Christ that enables us to come out of the darkness and the debauchery and the gunkiness of our sin to be washed clean, to be made new and to start over and to receive the love of a covenant-keeping God. What a mystery indeed to be the adulterer and to be received back with open arms. Father, we rejoice greatly in who you are and how you've loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.